I work at the Darabont County Archives, Part 6E. Written by Jenny Kino Shiamata. After finishing up at the sanatorium, we drove back to Precipice Bay, fueled solely by caffeine and adrenaline. We passed through the town plaza around 8.30, 9 a.m., somewhere in there. Nothing was said when we tromped back to the bungalow. In fact, I can't remember anyone saying anything in the short period between parking and collapsing in bed. I woke around 5 p.m., Alice, Jamie, and I were the first ones up, and we took off in one of the vans into town for coffee and donuts. The rest woke up after an hour or so. By 7 o'clock, everyone was up and downloading the footage begrudgingly, wishing for nothing more than an aspirin and more sleep. At 8 o'clock, we decided it was time for some supper, and then we headed out. Of course, we ended up back at McAdams. After what seemed like 50 single-serving barroom pizzas and a host of different burgers, not to mention 12 pitchers of beer, we were chatting upstairs when Tall Jim popped in and joined us for a bit of conversation around 11. Tall Jim listened quietly as Ken and Steve gabbed on about the paranormal experiences at the hole. He didn't seem particularly surprised by our stories. He was surprised when we told him that we hadn't found anything at Esther Cavett. There's some bad things at that place. I'm surprised you didn't see or hear anything. I've heard nothing but bad stories about that hospital. Did you know that it stands on Abenaki burial grounds? The tribes attacked the site during construction many times. Now we don't want it back since the ground is sour with pain and horror. No one wants it now, he said, then followed up by saying, I've never been to the hole. I don't go out to Cold Spring, but some of my friends who live and work in Fraser Lake have told me stories. Remind me to tell you about them some other time. He was on his second Roy Rogers by that time, and it was getting late. Ken quickly asked him if he knew anything about our next two stops, Morgan Hollow's train yard, or the Bleak Hill Asylum. He sucked down the rest of his drink and looked at us so seriously that I instantly felt sober. A glance to the rest of the group made it clear that they also felt that something was up. Jem pushed aside his empty glass and lay both arms on the table, looking down at his hands for a moment before he resumed his hawk-eyed stare and pointed a dark finger at Ken. The train yard's a bad place. Not necessarily haunted, mind you, but some dark things happened there even before the train stopped, and it hasn't gotten any better since. I'm not sure that you'll find anything there. It holds its darkness in, but I would be careful. It's a good thing that you're going in a group, a single person, or even a pair. I'm not so sure that I would be that brave. Bleak Hill, well, that place is just bad, bad. It doesn't hide darkness. You see it in every shadow and in every empty room. It isn't a place that has subtlety, if you know what I mean. Since the museum opened, I haven't heard anything dangerous, but sometimes places give you exactly what you think they're going to give you. It's a what-you-see-is-what-you-get kind of spook house. If places were people, Bleak Hill would be a stark raving lunatic. Violent, unpredictable, absolutely mad that place is. Be careful. And with that sobering declaration, Tall Jim went back to work. We dropped dead in the bungalow around 2 a.m. and were all awake and ready to get going by 10 in the morning. Morgan Hollows is about 45 minutes from the bay heading south and Bleak Hill is about 20 minutes from the hollows. The ghost tour at Bleak Hill didn't start until 4, so we had plenty of time to get to the train yard and do some investigating. We drove between the mountains surrounding Morgan Hollows around 11, past Motel 6s, courtyards, days inns, and the like on the outskirts. The downtown area was disturbingly retro. 
looking for all the world like it was the main street of Mayberry or Kingston Falls or some other town trapped in a nostalgia time warp. It felt like driving through the Universal Studios lot, like you could reach out and push the building facades down and there'd be nothing behind them except burly gaffers and cameramen. They even had a Woolsworth still in operation, or at least keeping the old style 50s sign. It was advertising a meatloaf special at the lunch counter and the drugstore had a soda fountain. This was the type of face that Morgan Hollows showed to the world, but at the darkest edge of the town, our destination seemed to dispel that image and revel in the rot underneath. Morgan Hollows is a quaint little town with more than its fair share of sordid history. Initially called Morkant Hollows, anti-Irish sentiment in the early 1900s caused the founding family to change the spelling of their name and the town. Founded sometime around 1750, the town sits in the Peabon Valley at the foot of Mount Warren, the tallest peak of the tall men. It's surrounded by a crescent of smaller mountains. The hollows used to be lush, fertile farmland, and produce was its dominant export, casting huge barges down the Arkley River to Brinksfield and New Stickney until it became the transport hub for Darabont County steel mills, mines, and logging industries. The Morgans grew rich over the generations. Miss Angie says they even named their mansion like the English aristocracy, and they still hold considerable clout in the county. The Hollows has the largest permanent population in the county aside from New Stickney and is primarily a tourist hub, boasting several high-class hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, and hostels for visitors. Skydale's, Fraser Lake, and Golden Bowls are all about an hour's drive from the town. So, tourists usually find it easier to stay in the Hollows reasonably priced hotels and drive out for skiing or what have you. The town has a national park nestled into the foothills with supposedly excellent hunting and fishing. The train yard lies at the furthest northern edge of the town in a sprawling graveyard of rusted cars and defunct engines. The entire area is surrounded by a chain link fence and is theoretically county property. But the fence has holes or is missing entirely in large stretches, making it easy for locals to sneak in and drink or party. Abandoned since the 60s, it's a festering eyesore in an otherwise bright and clean community. Calls for its destruction or development have risen off and on over the years, but the big reason it continues to exist is simply due to money. It would cost too much to move or destroy the husks and equipment in the area, which is itself the size of a small neighborhood. So it continues to sag in decrepitude. During the satanic panic of the 1980s, the sheriff's department received on average three calls to the train yard per week reporting devil worship. Teenage keggers, drug-fueled sex, and wild dogs were the usual suspects, but there were at least 12 bodies discovered from 1976 to the present. Some were obviously drug overdoses or cases of exposure, but the rest... Well, that's where the stories come in. The satanic panic of the 80s was a cultural phenomenon created by a perfect storm of right-wing evangelical Christians believing in the corruption of the innocent, a legacy of paranormal resurgence from the 70s, and some unfortunate legal incidents at the beginning of the decade, a belief in repressed memory retrieval and hypnotically enhanced remembrance started the movement and dovetailed with shocking stories of child abuse, both sexual and physical. The American public was simply unable to reconcile child abuse with the Christian beliefs in mankind's gentle nature, and so Satanism and the paranormal became scapegoats. I'm not going to get far into it, but it's important to remember that the 80s was a decade where hidden cults and sexually depraved Satanists seemed to hide in plain sight for the common man. Never mind the biggest court case at the time, the McMartin Preschool Abuse Case, 
was a hotbed of coerced nonsense and legalese that turned expensive to taxpayers and laborious to the public at large. The belief in an overarching satanic conspiracy, present in all levels of society, government, and business, characterizes the panic and, thankfully, it has disappeared mostly in recent times. I just figure it's better to give some context to the stories out in the train yard for people who weren't alive or aren't American. Anyway, pentagrams, inverted crosses, and goat's heads were routinely graffitied on the derelict trains, and the people living nearest the train yard in low-income neighborhoods reported dim lights and chanting. Now, whether this is true or not is not really important. What matters is that the sheriff's department instituted drive-by patrols from roughly 1983 to 1991 in response to the multitude of reports. But even that didn't stop all of the horror stories surrounding the train yard. It was and still is entirely possible to have a rave or a party with a bonfire in the heart of the yard with no light or sound reaching the disused road that the sheriff's deputies drove down twice a night. Law enforcement, themselves more than a little superstitious, never entered the yard at night except in force. The train yard caretaker slash guard from 1973 to 1982 was one Dwight Brawley. Born in Fraser Lake, married to Edith Brawley, nay Gorman of Morgan Hollows, and the father of two sons, Alan and Ross. The county hired him to mend the fences, keep an eye on the rusting husks, and for general upkeep. Cutting grass, siphoning oil and gasoline from the engines, and ensuring that fires didn't start. Dwight Browley was the one who discovered the horrific sight one cold December morning. At 9.53 on December 12, 1981... The Morgan Hollow Sheriff Station received a panicked call from Brawley reporting dead animals in the center of the yard. Deputies Peter Migley and Mark Simon were dispatched to investigate and take Brawley's statement. At 10.27, they called the main office in Brahms and requested Sheriff Ethan Lagerton and animal control. The center of the train yard is mostly clear and once housed a massive track switcher and turnstile. It was removed for scrap in 1971. In the center of the clearing that cold December morning was a massive black pentagram and in the center lay a dead deer. The pentagram's lines were about a foot thick and made from asphalt, not paint. That immediately set up warning bells for the sheriff. At each of the points of the pentagram was a dead cat or dog and each intersection of the asphalt lines had a decapitated bird. One dead deer, three cats, two dogs, and ten birds all lay dead. There were fat red candles surrounding the entire grisly tableau. The deer had been dressed in the center of the design, its decapitated head sitting upright on the neck stump as if overseeing its own evisceration. Its intestines were overlaid on the central lines. The cats and dogs were mostly intact, save for their slit throats. All of the bodies were still soft, meaning that they hadn't been exposed to the 23-degree air long enough to freeze. And, despite some spillage and the obvious splashes from where the deer had been butchered, there wasn't much blood from the rest of the animals. Someone had killed them elsewhere and brought them to this location before arranging them in that grotesque pattern. The Hollows Gazette reported, Hideous animal disfigurement and satanic cult sacrifice in the next day's issue and followed it up with a smaller article hidden below the gutter that Sheriff Lagerton had arrested Richard Dick Chapel, aged 46, for stealing county property and suspicion of Satanism. Chapel was a lower-level public works employee responsible for road maintenance, single with no living family. He had lived in Petersham and Athol before being hired by Morgan Hollows, and he now lived in a provided apartment by a shell yard just outside of town. 
An asphalt paver had gone missing from the Hollows Department of Public Works along with two 50-pound boxes of crack sealant. Only Chapel had access to these things. It was only when they searched Chapel's apartment that the full extent of the man's disturbance came to light. The Sheriff Department records list the following items discovered in Chapel's apartments. 36 books on the occult. Two boxes of 76 red wax candles. One carton of cigarettes unopened. Four small baggies filled with two ounces of cocaine apiece. Seven burned plain wood crosses. Three hunting knives, two of which were covered in dried blood that was later determined to be from a deer. Two two-liter bottles partially filled with human blood in the refrigerator. Test determined that it was not a match to chapel. One box containing 36 privately printed pamphlets titled Dark Feast of the Devil. One human skull. Six human femurs. 27 assorted human finger and toe bones. Disassembled and in a glass jar. 23 pornographic magazines of various types two pairs of chrome handcuffs, and three three-count boxes of condoms. Needless to say, it was enough to send Chapel away. Like all things in the county, the whole mess was swept under the rug and forgotten publicly, but continued to seethe in the dark gossip and rumors of the area. Investigations into the pamphlets yielded nothing, and no one knew Chapel even had friends, let alone led satanic rituals. The human remains discovered were quickly determined to be from elderly people due to the obvious signs of osteoporosis, and Chapel quickly admitted to grave robbing. But he refused to explain the five pints of human blood in his refrigerator. From December 12, 1981 until December 31, 1983, there was a permanent sheriff's department presence outside the train yard. There were no major disturbances during that period aside from teenage drinking and vagrancy, but that didn't stop the frequent calls from neighbors. The train yard was officially a den of Satanism and ritual sacrifice in the townspeople's minds and nothing was going to dissuade them from that belief. A cat went missing. It was sacrificed down at the train yard. Church cross disappeared, used for a black mass down at the train yard. Child missing, check at the train yard. From 1984 to 1988, there were two bodies discovered at the train yard. The first was a vagrant who froze to death outside the fence during a snowstorm trying to get into the yard. He was found a week later on November 21, 1985. The other was a known prostitute, Phoenix Rivers, who was found naked in a boxcar on July 3, 1987. She was a strange anomaly since her throat and chest were practically melted, exposing her ribs and liquefying her organs. It was later discovered that drain cleaner crystals had been poured down her throat. While neither of these deaths had anything to do with Satanism or devil worship, that didn't stop them from feeding into the legend of the train yard. The final incident that inextricably linked the train yard to devil worship came in 1994. It began on the night of Tuesday, August 9th when teenagers partying in the yard discovered a human hand. It was not a clean cut, nor was it in good condition. It was a woman's right hand that had been severed about three inches up the forearm. Muscles and scar tissue had been roughly scraped from the bone with a flat-bladed tool, and bones were snapped on a metal fulcrum. The weather at the time meant that insects and scavengers had been at the appendage for at least 48 hours. The coroner ruled out accidental dismemberment. There had been some cases over the years when settling cars had severed limbs from vagrants and teens. He stated that the wear on the bones indicated repeated scrapes with a straight-edged metal tool. Fingerprints revealed the missing hand belonged to a local waitress, Tanya Serend. 
age 33. Tanya had not been reported missing at the time, and she was last seen when she left her shift at 128 Main, a local hole in the wall, the previous Friday night. She had been arrested for public intoxication and lewd behavior in 1988, but she showed no signs of being a prostitute or drug addict. So the sheriff's department determined that she had been abducted at some point after 11.30 p.m. on August 5th. None of the local hospitals or doctors had seen or treated anyone for dismemberment. Sheriff Lagerton ordered a comprehensive search of the train yard but didn't find anything. The case went cold. The Hollows Gazette had a virtually permanent banner at the bottom of the front page urging anyone with information to contact the sheriff's department. But no news came in and no witnesses came forward and the county began to forget. That is, until the morning of Sunday, November 13th. Norman Spears, 37, had taken his son Gabe hunting for deer in the Arkley Forest at the base of the Tallman. The early morning had passed without seeing any bucks, and the two were in a deer blind having a late breakfast or early lunch. It was a windy and cold season, so the windows of the blind were zippered up. Spears says that in the middle of pouring coffee, the pair heard something fall on the roof and suddenly began smelling something foul. They looked outside and saw a clump of leaves on the ground by the door. Thinking that maybe a squirrel's nest had been dislodged by the wind, the pair investigated. It was not a squirrel's nest or a clump of leaves. It was, in fact, a decomposing human head surrounded by tangled, matted black hair. The coroner's report states that the cause and time of death were impossible to determine as the head had been frozen solid prior to being left for an undetermined length of time in the heat and sun, hastening the decomposition and scavenger activity. Most of the soft tissue had been torn off, consumed by animals, and the brain had liquefied in the intense heat. However, the teeth were in perfect condition, and so it was quickly discovered that the head belonged to Tanya Sarand. Sheriff Lagerton called a search party to sweep the forest for any more remains or evidence, but none were found. With two body parts and no leads, the case once again went cold. The winter of 1994 and 95 was especially cold and brought snow and sleet to the region. The cold lasted well into April, and it wasn't until May that the biggest piece of the mystery was found that forever cemented Tanya Sarand in the annals of Darabont County lore. At 11.23 a.m. on Wednesday, May 17th, Donald Waller, a resident of Enfield on the northern bank of the Arkley River, called Animal Control to report a dead beaver washed up in his backyard. Waller was a dog breeder and kept himself and his animals well away from the rotting pile until officials arrived. Doug Muller and Robert Benson were the Animal Control staff on call and quickly made their way downriver from Brahms. At 12.44 p.m., they called the sheriff's department to report human remains. Deputy Chester Reed of the Morgan Hollows office responded to the call since Sheriff Lagerton was indisposed. At 1.12 p.m., he called dispatch and told them the sheriff was needed immediately. The lump of pale flesh that washed up in Waller's backyard was a human torso. It was just the gross trunk of a body, missing arms, legs, and head. Its stomach was split open and the skin was stretched taut over the ribs. The arms had been torn from the shoulder sockets, but presented precise cuts under the deltoid. The legs had been severed in a similar fashion an inch below the buttocks. Water scavengers had started in on the body, but it wasn't in an advanced state of decomposition. Rather, it was bloodless and organless with bone white skin. Photographs of the scene clearly show how empty the abdominal cavity was as you could see through to the spinal cord and ribs. It was a grisly sight, but it was the exposed ribs and sternum that set everyone's hackles up. 
The exposed bone and cartilage were covered in intricately drawn designs that were soon revealed to be lines upon lines of tiny text. The text was runic in design, but they weren't any symbols that the experts at Missouri, Middleburg, Norwich, or the University of Vermont had ever seen. Each symbol was one-fourth of a centimeter high, and the bones were covered in them to the point that from a distance the bones appeared to be black. It was written in an alcohol-based permanent ink, of which there are innumerable kinds on the market. It had been drawn using a hypodermic needle as a nib. It proved impossible to trace the suspects through the text. Due to the reasonably intact mammary tissue and a tattoo of two black cherries above the torso's left buttock, it was quickly determined that the torso belonged to Tanya Sarand and the cold case was reopened. The torso had been kept refrigerated but not frozen like the head, and the lack of decomposition and opportunistic scavenger damage led the pathologist to the conclusion that the torso had been dumped or had fallen into the Arkley River no more than 24 hours prior to its discovery. That significantly shrank the search down to Morgan Hollows or the State Park. After 16 months of on-again, off-again investigation, the case once again went cold. There were simply too many unknowns surrounding the dismemberment and death, and there were no leads. Every freezer or commercial larder large enough to hold a human body was searched and inspected, but nothing beyond animal blood was ever found. No one reported any suspicious dumping in the river, and no further body parts were found. Tanya's left arm, upper right arm, legs, and organs were never found. Miss Angie alerted me to the wild bastardization that Tanya's genitals were missing, supposedly scooped out smoothly like a disassembled autonomy doll, as well as talk that the sheriff's department received their own from hell style letter from the killer. I've unfortunately seen the coroner's report, and it doesn't mention any kind of genital mutilation aside from stating that they were intact and showed no signs of sexual assault. Likewise, the story about the letter is hogwash. Mr. Barry and I traced that little ditty back to an op-ed piece in the Birkinsfield Dispatch, nicknamed here the Birkinsfield Disgrace. In it, an anonymous reader attacked the sheriff's department for covering up what they know about the murder. This was after a long paragraph, where the letter writer asserted that the government was doing black magic experiments with Nazi science. Because, of course it was. Obviously, the high-profile nature of the case and the wide publicity regarding the sheriff's department's investigation yielded a huge dividend in rumors and gossips of Satanism and witchcraft. The mysterious glyphs painstakingly drawn on Tanya's ribs only made the public's belief in black magic sacrifice grow until only the most passionate thrill-seekers or the biggest groups of teenage partiers would ever trespass into the train yard at night. The county doesn't currently employ a groundskeeper for the area, and the sheriff's rounds are infrequent. When we pulled up to the main gate of the train yard and parked on the gravel, Steve explained that there was a dirt path from the main gate to the center of the yard, but we discovered that the gate was secured by a new-looking padlock. After checking our equipment and getting ready, we slipped through a large hole in the chain-link fence about 30 feet down the side. Steve and Kitty had been here before for parties in high school, so they remembered how to get into the center of the yard. It was an imposing place. Train cars were stacked on top of each other in long rows along one side of the area, and the rest were littered haphazardly around with seemingly no rhyme or reason. Aside from the wide dirt lane leading from the main gate to the center, there were no easy pathways through. So we had to follow a circuitous route weaving around the rusting husks. Thankfully, there were spray-painted arrows helpfully put up by previous explorers that led to the center. There was a constant creaking of settling metal and squeaking hinges that set us all on edge. 
The air was tinged with copper and the sharp scent of bare metal. You could practically taste it in the air. I don't know if it was purely psychosomatic or what, but my fillings were singing like when you bite down on a piece of tin foil. Ken and Steve were in front with the thermo while the rest of us meandered after them in single file with audio recorders. After the spectral events at the hole, I think we were all on tether hooks. Alice and Downey were huddled together. Cecily was bunched with Meg and Terry. Jamie was getting pretty chummy with Jimmy. And I walked with Alex and Kitty at the back. The EMF meters were going crazy, bouncing back and forth from nothing to burying the needle and everything in between. Ken and Steve posited that it was due to all the electronics still in the engines drawing halting power from dying batteries. Not that that explanation made any sense at all since the husk had been inactive for over 40 years. The place had a presence that was distinctly cold. You walked in and your mind just immediately told you that the temperature dropped 20 degrees even if the thermo and everything else including the sweat running down your back, maintained that nothing had changed and it was still 75 degrees. It was like being scared, that sensation in your limbs of everything drawing inward, like all the heat and electricity, all that potential energy, was slowly being wound around your bones. Every sound, every sight seemed clearer, Sharper. It was the adrenaline that made time seem to slow as we traipsed through the rust yard. Alex and Kitty started walking closer to me as we got further inside. Everyone could feel it in the air. The path to the center was strewn with every type of litter you could conceive. Cigarette butts, condoms, food wrappers, beer cans, liquor bottles, torn clothing and it was dotted with burned barrels and melted candles. The creaking sounds faded the further you went with the smell of oil, gas, and metal growing disgustingly thick. We stopped in front of a green train car with This Way to Party Central emblazoned on the side in green paint. Ken and Steve were looking intently at the thermo display. There's something weird here. Something cold just ran under the car. Ken rewound the footage and sure enough, something very cold blinked under the sun-warmed metal of the car in front of us. Maybe we should circle around, he said. One side of the car was still attached to another that looked like a bomb had blown off the roof. Twisted metal shards of metal, oily black, blooming like a flower around the hole. None of us wanted to chance tetanus or something worse from a scrape, so the group quickly shot the idea down. I don't think that Ken was miffed. In fact, he looked relieved when no one wanted to investigate. He resumed filming and we followed the arrow to Party Central. Steve quickly told us that the center was just around the corner and we broke out in a nervous jog. The center of the train yard was about the size of a basketball court and surrounded by stacked cars. There was a tall, double-decker commuter car strewn across the dirt path to the gate, effectively blocking the center from direct sight. It made sense that parties would happen here from an intellectual standpoint. But, even under direct sunlight in the middle of the day... The place seemed too creepy for people to actually enjoy themselves. I suppose the silence contributed to the eeriness of the location. It would probably be hard to be scared if Black Sabbath or Nirvana was blaring in your ears along with 20 other people. Anyway, the entire roughly circular area was covered in gravel and the odd wood railway tie along with the usual garbage strewn around from parties. It's hard for me to put into words how it felt, standing in the middle of the center. It seemed gray, almost like the world had lost all of its color and the air any scent. That, combined with the silence, made it uniquely unsettling. There were charcoal mounds haphazardly laid out in the gravel and a few tiki lights stuck in the ground around the perimeter. 
Each crunch of our shoes on the gravel made a horrendous shriek in the stillness. It was an alien landscape and we were not welcome. The EMF's going nuts, guys, Jimmy said. Everywhere I point, it's burying the needle. Steve and Kitty held up their audio recorders. Listen, there's someone here. As if manifested from their words, we all started hearing a low droning sound. We all flicked on our audio recorders. It, it sounds like chanting. It sounded like low Gregorian chant, but without words. Or it was so soft that it was impossible to make out individual words. But there were breaks in the sound. There's definitely something here. Ken warned. Those cold things are darting back and forth under the cars. Are you recording the noise? The equalizer is definitely picking up something, I reported. It was faint, but the display was showing a regular up and down in time with the chanting. Then it got louder. As odd and funny a comparison as it was, I was reminded of acapella groups where someone performs as percussion it was still deep, but it also had a drumbeat quality to it. Every third beat, there was a higher return sound like clockwork, while the rest of the voices continued the main melody. I immediately considered that someone might be playing an elaborate trick on us with hidden speakers, but that didn't explain the thermos. Is that a language or just noise? Steve asked. Kitty was recording the audio beside him. It sounds like voices, she said. Guys. Ken was backing slowly away with his eyes glued to the thermo. I think that we should go, he said. I moved behind him and looked at the thermo. Warm metal was orange all around us, but colder blue and purple blobs were slithering out from underneath the trains. I looked with my own eyes and I saw absolutely nothing in the midday sun, but the thermo still showed the cold anomalies. They were all around us and moving closer. The chanting grew softer. Let's just head back to the gate now, okay everybody? Steve said he was beside me and saw them too. Just start walking down the path and we'll climb out the fence. Haltingly, it was, it seemed, an eternity. We backed out of the center and down the path towards the gate. The sounds began fading the further we were from the area, and Ken reported that the blobs weren't moving beyond the center. By the time we reached the double-decker car, the chanting had faded completely, and even the EMF was flat. Once we passed the car, everything changed. It was like someone poured color back into the world. Suddenly the sound of insects roared back into our ears along with the smell of rust and rot. The sun blared down on us from directly overhead and it suddenly felt like it was 200 degrees. It was a funny little moment as we looked at each other. Almost like we'd shared a bad dream. We smiled and looked up at the blue sky. It was like napping on the beach. Your eyes get so used to the darkness that when you open them, everything is stars. We rode that euphoria down the path, joking and laughing until we reached the gate. The gate was wide open. The padlock, still locked, sat in the middle of the dirt path. We all agreed that the padlock was on the gate and that the gate was closed when we arrived. Suddenly, the EMF went nuts, wailing in our pockets. We all quickly crossed the threshold of the gate in a panic. Ken flipped back on the thermo once we all had contact with the vans, but there was nothing but the heat. It was only 1.30, meaning that we'd only been in the yard for about two hours. But it felt like half the day. We were all covered in sweat and dying of thirst. After drinking half the case of water in the van, it was clear why Tall Jim had given us the warning. If we had gone in pairs, who knows what would have happened. We'd probably be scattered in panic, scraped against some dirty metal and been in the hospital. 
or worse. As it stood, the experience still shook us. But it wasn't anything like the hole's apparitions. Just noises and shapes. It seemed terrifying in the moment. But it was clear that whatever was in the train yard didn't want to hurt us, per se. Just spook us. The force, evil, creature, whatever you wanted to label it, had just wanted us gone. Maybe we were too big a force to trap or overpower. Maybe there wasn't anything there at all. It was hard to say. High EMF fields and rapid fluctuations have been known to cause feelings of oppression, paranoia, and fear. But there was also the distinct suspicion that there could be some busted mechanics in the engines generating infrasound. The fear frequency of vibration just below human hearing. It's also been linked to visual hallucinations due to sympathetic resonance of the eyeballs. I'm not saying that what we saw and experienced was due to infrasound or high EMF. I mean, it certainly doesn't explain the shapeless blobs caught by the thermo. But our perception of the area could have certainly been shaped by such circumstances. There was a faint breeze that day. Maybe enough to spin some forgotten fans. We decided to grab lunch at 128 Main. Just because it was associated with our investigation... We thought it'd be best to eat before heading out to Bleak Hill Asylum.